we are going to be beginning a uh, another series of dealing with, um, of course, you know, Passover, Easter season is coming up. So we're going to start dealing with a, a, a group of messages that will deal with Christ's death. Um, this whole system was given to us. It was taken from a message given by um, Michael Morrison. He's a gentleman in the church, and he's gives a lot of messages, and he does a lot for our congregation. And he got it from a gentleman by the name of Alistair McGarth, who wrote a book called Understanding Jesus. And so that's where this comes from, if any of you want to get the book and read it or anything. Anyways, what we're going to do is the first, uh, it'll be a series of a question and then different parts of that question. And the question is, why did Jesus have to die? And then uh, the part we're going to do today is he was born to die. The next one will be the suffering servant dying and accused death. Messages of the cross. That's just message of the cross. And then victory, sacrifice, and then seven images of salvation. And that's, all, that's kind of a series that we're going to go through to get us to start thinking about what our Lord did for us why he did it, and what are the ramifications of what he did for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read through the section, and it'll take about five minutes, and I'll try not to stumble too much, but it's good for me to read out loud. And I have to do it from the small print, because when I was uh, printing this on my computer, there was a bunch of dots between each word. So I finally figured out how to get rid of that, and I was so happy I didn't notice that. It also took out all the verses. <laughs> so anyways, I'm going to read this from the small print, and I'll do my best. Okay, why did Jesus have to die? Jesus had an amazingly productive ministry, teaching and healing thousands. He attracted large crowds and had potential for much more. He could have healed thousands more by traveling to the Jews and the Gentiles who lived in other areas. But Jesus allowed this work to come to a sudden end. He could have avoided arrest, but he chose to die instead of expanding his ministry. Although his teachings were important, he had come not just to teach, but also to die. Death was an important part of Jesus' ministry. This is the way we remember him, through the cross as a symbol of Christianity, or through the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. Our Savior is a Savior who died. The Old Testament tells us that God appeared on earth on several occasions. If Jesus wanted only to heal and teach, he could have simply appeared. But he did more. He became a human. Why? Here's an important reason, so he could die. To understand Jesus, we need to understand his death. His death is part of the gospel, message, and something all Christians should know about. I suspect everybody in this room knows that Christ came and died for us. They born to die. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom so many. That's in Matthew 20, 28. He came to give his life to die, and his death would result in salvation for others. This is why he came to earth. His blood was poured out, was poured out for others. Matthew 26, 28. Jesus warned his disciples that he would suffer and die, but they did not seem to believe it. Jesus, get, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen. To you, Matthew 16, 21 and 22. Jesus knew that he must die because the scripture said so. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? That's in Mark 9, 12, 9, 31, and 10, 33 to 34. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Luke 24, 26, and 27. It happened according to God's plan. Herod and Pilate did only what God had decided beforehand should happen. Acts 4, 28. 
in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus knew that he would soon be crucified, Jesus asked his father if there might be some other way, but there was none. This was it's Luke 22, I think that's 42, it might be 12. His death was necessary for our salvation. That's a very good overview of the biggest reason why Jesus came. However, when we look at that, Christianity in this time of year tends to just look at that aspect. It's a wonderful aspect. His death allows us to live forever with God. But that's a future thing. That doesn't really affect us right now. And I find that that's very interesting because when I was thinking about this sermon, I go, what more can you say about that? He came, he did what he did, and he passed away, was killed, resurrected, went back to heaven, and now all humanity gets to live forever with God. And it struck me as I was thinking about it that it much more, much, much more than just living forever. There's a right now part of this, and it's the part that we really need to understand and key into. Jesus made a statement in John, and he said, No greater love has a man than he lays down his life for his friend. And you know, we've been going through a lot of different things, a kind of a different way of looking at Scripture, rather than coming from the idea that God doesn't love us because we're sinners, and that he's not with us, and that we're alone. And that when Jesus died, that made us a way for him to come back to us. Realizing that really what happened was we sat down and played our video games and we ignored him. He was always there. Throughout scripture, he's always there. Always. He has never left us. He has always loved us. But we are free moral agents. But we have the right to ignore him. You know, on the cross, when Jesus was towards the end of his life, he said something that was always made me wonder. And I've always taken it as God left him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said it. It's recorded. And I have always taken that as God had to turn away because all sin rested on his shoulders. But with thinking at it from the idea that God would never leave him, no matter what, sin doesn't bother the Father. He doesn't have to look away from us from, because of sin. He sees us. He sees his children, whom he loves dearly. Have you ever noticed that when we're in, David does this a lot, King David, in his psalms and things, he says, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? When you're in a great trial, whether you caused it yourself or somebody else caused it for you, it is, God, why have you left me? Why have you not fixed this? Why are you not here? That's what we think. That's the human way, because a lot of us believe that he leaves when we sin. He does not. And I've been wondering, Jesus came to experience what it is to be human. So that we can go to him and know that he understands absolutely every feeling we have. He understands why we have the thoughts we have. He knows. He lived it. Can you imagine what it would have been like for the God of the universe, the creator of all things, who has lived in the love of the Father and the Holy Spirit forever? For at that moment, to experience all the hate, all the anger, all the lack of love that all humanity has ever had towards the Father. And he would have felt that at that moment. And by calling out, why have you forsaken me? He says, I understand my children, my brothers and sisters. I know what this feels like. Could that possibly be what happened? At that moment, could our Lord have actually been totally human? 
cried out the way we all cry out. We don't think to cry out, Dad, I've left you. Help me come back. Which is what Jesus' death was all about. It gave us a track home. It gave us something that we may not have ever realized and may not believe and may not key in on. On the way home, as always happens, I gave this sermon at Tacoma yesterday. And whenever I give these sermons, my only hope is that the Holy Spirit will enter each and every one of us, open our minds to something. And, you know, yesterday's sermon is different from this one because they're never quite the same. I just don't follow notes. Sorry. <laughs> but she said to me, you know, one of the things that Jesus' death and resurrection gave is a confidence that everything's going to be okay. I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to be afraid of what's going on. I have, it's a confidence that it gives us. And we don't think about that much. But his death and resurrection gave us that. Why? Because the veil was rent. And the old way of having to go through a religion to get to the Father is gone. You can go directly to him, sit down in his lap, and bawl if you need to. And he'll sit there and stroke your head and your back until you're better. When Jesus died for us, he died not because he had to, because he didn't. God could have saved us any way he so choose. He could have. But when they were deciding how everything was going to happen, they decided this is the best way. Because laying your life down for another is the ultimate love. It's showing that you care. I knew an old guy a long time ago who used to say that love is an outgoing concern for others. And that's very true. It's when we do things so that maybe we don't want to, but we know it's good for somebody. It will help them, so we do it anyway. A husband not buying a boat so that he can buy a home for his family. It seems like a very minor thing, but it's not. I know young men who have indebted their family so deep in debt, they may never get out just for adrenaline rushes. I look back on my own life, and I think about how I never spend money on myself. I've never had the certain things that I wanted to have. And if I allow it, it would make me angry. But if you look at it from Jesus' perspective, from his death and resurrection, from what he changed in our lives, you go, that was a really good thing, and I'm glad I did it. I really didn't need that stuff. What I needed is to learn how to love like the Father loves. You see, the interesting thing about that is, if you look at God, there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we're with him, that love is the same for all three of them. And that is the love that God wants to instill in us. This morning, Nancy was listening to a tape by a guy, and he, he was mentioning that one of his daughters had a little cancer on her pituitary gland. And this is kind of interesting. It fits right in here. And the guy says, as a human dad, I will do anything to remove that. I would reach in and pluck it out if I could. God the Father sees all kinds of cancers on our brains, on our heart, on our souls, even on our bodies. But he's not so concerned about the physical body. He's concerned about the spiritual body, your soul, your heart, your mind. And he will do anything to reach in and pluck those out. And the very first thing he did was sacrifice his own son. And the main reason was so we know that he loves us. If you read all the stories about all the fake gods, none of them sacrificed themselves for the, for the people that were worshiping them. The true God is an amazing fellow. 
He's not so concerned about himself. He's concerned about each and every one of you. He wants you to love him. That's all he wants. Because he knows if we love him, and he loves us, then that love will inspire us to live life that he knows will bring us happiness and joy. He knows it. And so he spends all of his time allowing us to do whatever we want to do, and then come in and say, you know, that wasn't such a wise thing. And I'm really sorry you have to go through all this stuff because of it. But I love you, and I'm here with you, and we will get through this. Like Nancy's dad says, I have a big shovel. So no matter how deep you dig yourself, I can help you out. You know, we have an idea as Christians that we have to prove to the Father that we're worthy of his love. I don't believe that's true at all. It's kind of like you're down in the bottom of a pit. And the light is, of course, Jesus calling you out of that pit. But you can't see that. You can't see that forgiveness. You can't see that you're already forgiven. And none of that physical stuff matters. The only thing that matters is your heart. Do you love the Father? That's all that matters to God. And so you decide you're going to do good deeds to show God that you love him. So every good deed you do to show God you love him, you dig down. And you're digging deeper. And you're digging yourself deeper. And the light's still there, shining brightly. And then a time comes when Jesus reveals himself to an individual. He lowers himself in a bucket. And he looks at you and he says, hop in. No, I have to prove myself. You dig yourself deeper. He comes down with you. And then one day, as you all remember, God all around us, playing our video games, ignoring him, we look up and go, wow, who are you? And he tells you. And you realize, man, i got to quit digging. And you climb into the bucket with him. And off you go, up to the light. And your life starts to change. Because you realize something. When Jesus died for us, he took away the guilt. He took away the suffering. He took away the fact that we might think we're away from God. Because at the Garden of Eden, when they sinned, he threw them out of the garden. He didn't throw them out of the garden because he was mad at them, or he hated them, or he didn't love them because they sinned. It's that he didn't want them to live forever as a human, making bad choices, making their lives miserable. So he had to protect them from eating of the tree of life. Until such time as the tree of life comes back in the form of our Lord Jesus Christ, dies, destroys that other tree, then we can eat of the tree of life. And that tree of life is Jesus. And that seed he gives us is the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is our teacher, our guide. But because we're free moral agents, he never, ever forces us to do anything. However, he's all around us all the time. Good deeds, ha- good deeds happen abundantly. And all we have to do is look up from our video game and see it. And then good deeds become joyous. All the good things that God's doing around you, you can take part of. And the cool part is you're never guilty and you're never responsible for it. Jesus is. You never have to get up and try to get somebody to tell you how wonderful you are. Because we're not. Jesus is. So here's the interesting part. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have Jesus in you. You have the Father. You're in the Father. You're in the Holy Spirit. You're in Jesus. You are a child of the Most High God. If God is God's last name, your last name is God. And as our understanding of what love really is grows. As we see Father and Son and Holy Spirit as an incredibly loving God who created us to be his children, 
who made up a plan that will ensure that our salvation will happen. It's an amazing thing what God did with Jesus' death. You know, they like to say that you know, when Jesus, you know, when Jesus was praying, he asked God, is there any other way this can happen? And I've thought about that a lot. If that were true, then that would probably mean that Jesus really didn't want to do it. He was going to do it because the Father told him to. But thinking from the human side, as a human, I wouldn't want to do it, not because I didn't love the people, because it was going to hurt physical pain. He was going to suffer physical pain. And as a human, you don't want to do that. But you know, when you look at what God did, he really answered that prayer. Because crucifixions generally take about three days. You're hanging on that cross. But Jesus was only on that cross for what, six, seven hours? Not really a long time, considering. God allowed him to die. But in a way, God did answer that prayer. Because it could have drug on for days. And God has that same love for us. You know, he's not going to let bad things drag on very long. It just isn't. He's going to step in. Because he can step into your life. I have the Holy Spirit in me. And my God has the right to step into my life at any moment that he feels he needs to. Do we all feel that? You have that right because Jesus died. Do we understand the scope of his death? The scope of what he did? It's amazing. It's just amazing. The more you think about it, the more you pray about it, the more you consider what he did, I just become, wow. Man, if he could do all that, I could surely go up to somebody who asked me the question, where do you get, why do you believe what you believe? And tell them, because my God came to earth and he showed his love by dying for me. He died for you too. You don't have to suffer like this. You don't have to live in anguish. You don't have to live in fear of what's going to happen. You don't. We should have a contented, happy life, not worrying about what tomorrow is going to bring so much. Of course, you have to plan. You do. But there should be no anguish in your heart. You know, it's like my job. Up until just recently, I realized that I allowed that job to bring anguish to my heart. Why? Because I had lost track. I had sat down with my video game. I wasn't paying attention to God. I wasn't dancing with him the way I should. See, all those fears go away when you realize that that person standing in front of you, oh, I work at Lowe's for you, so I work with people wonderful and crazy every day. And when you realize that you're standing in front of a human being that God loves, that God is with, then you don't worry about what your feelings are of inadequacy, of maybe I can't help this guy, or I don't know, or he expects something from me I can't give. You don't worry about that. What you're worrying about is, I love this guy, and I'm going to do everything I can to help him. And those, all that kind of anxiety and misery goes away. Satan does not want us to see that God loves everybody. He doesn't. He wants us to think he hates everyone like he does. Because when we see how God loves absolutely every human being on this planet, ever lived and ever will live, that he was willing to allow his own son to die on that cross, which is a horrible death. Just watch the Passion of the Cross and you'll get an idea of how horrible that death was. I mean, it's just, I have never watched it. I can't. When I think about his death and what he went through, and that I am personally the cause of that, I can't. 
can't watch it. I just don't want to. I suppose if I had to and was forced to, I would. But if as long as I have a choice, I'm not. I may watch up to it and then after it, but I'm not watching his crucifixion. It's too horrible. And the thing is, he did it willingly. Why? Because he loves you. He loves each and every one of you. And he's not concerned about the mistakes we make. He's not concerned about the fool things we do. What he's concerned about is, is your love for the Father steadily growing? Have you ever watched a Christian when they're young? We're nuts. We do all kinds of crazy things. We think we're doing it for the Lord. But as we go, he teaches us a lot. Look at the old Christians running around. For the most part, they're happy. They're content. They're loving. They're caring. They're concerned about others. They aren't so concerned about themselves. They have their problems. Age brings on some terrible problems. But they know that God loves them. They understand that love isn't something that you earn. Love is a gift. Plain and simple. You can't buy love. You can't earn love. You can't make love. Love is a gift from the Father. And he proved that by Jesus coming, fully God, fully human, and dying on that cross, experiencing everything we experience. And through him, God and the Holy Spirit experience everything we experience. They know what we feel. And they want us to know what they feel. They want us to be part of their family. And if we have believed that Jesus is the Son of the Most High God, and we've been baptized, and we've received the Holy Spirit, we are a child of the Most High God. And that is something else that's amazing. You're no longer a citizen of the planet Earth. You are a citizen of heaven. Satan's world and God's world run hand in hand. And God allows his world to be slightly screwed up. He does. Did you know that um, the word religion means rebind? Human beings think they're separated from God, but we had to come up with ways to rebind ourselves to God. We've never been separated from God. So when you think of it, religion is not technically part of the kingdom of God. Jesus as king is the kingdom of God. And all of us are part of that. And so you see all the Christian churches, oh, we're right about this, we're right about that, you're right about this, you're wrong, blah, 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 we fight and bicker. But when it comes right down to it, each individual Christian is the kingdom of God on earth. Not the churches. The church is the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is people. Wherever they are, whoever they are. And a lot of the people who are part of the body of Christ may not even know Christ's name. But they live love. And the day will come when Jesus will reveal himself to them. And they will accept him handily. I see a lot of people out there who live the life of love, kindness, gentleness, helping people, doing their best not to abuse anyone. And then you can ask them about Christ. Eh, maybe, maybe not. They might have not heard the name, but they might not know the, you know, know the particulars. So as we go into this season, remember that Jesus' death was an act of love. He did it because he loves us. He wants us to know he loves us. He wants us to know that we don't have to suffer emotionally. We don't have to suffer spiritually. We don't have to suffer physically. Because even when you're sick, if you realize that your next waking moment when you die is going to be in the kingdom, 
with the Father, with a perfect spirit body that will never get sick again, the pain's not so bad. Because most of our pain is our body reacting to our mind. Not so much what's wrong with our body. And if you're in a hospital and you're talking with people who are in terrible illness, those whose mind is on God, those who realize who they are, their pain isn't so bad. Sure, it hurts. But it's not excruciating. Because a lot of that excruciating pain is mental. Your body reacts to your brain. Jesus came to relieve us of all that. He died so that we can experience love. Unfortunately, in American culture, love is kind of means sex. But it's not. Sex is just, sex is sex, love is love. And the hope is, is that sex comes out of love. That's what the hope is. So as we go through this season, and you're out just talking with friends or acquaintances and talking about things, and you know, people generally will ask a question when God is calling them, what makes you what you are? You know, as Christians, one of our great commissions is to spread the gospel. And the gospel is Jesus. And part of that gospel is his death. You can look at him right straight in the eye, and you can tell him, my God loves me. Oh, he loves you too. He has always loved you. There has never been a moment when he hasn't loved you. And there's never been a moment when you've been alone. He is always there with you. And then if you want to have some fun with him, and you know some things about him, you know, when you did such and such, uh -huh, he was there. You know, when you did this or that, he was there. But anyways, when we're speaking about Christ, part of the thing that we need to do when we're speaking to people who don't really believe is shock them a little bit. Make them think. Make them look up from their video game and see God dancing around them. We can tell them that God's always there. He's always doing good deeds all around you. God does the good deeds. We don't. Scripture states all good deeds come from God. Get them to understand that God is a loving, kind, gentle God. And that we as Western Christians have come from things from an odd point of view, which makes it very difficult to get people to understand who Jesus is. Because what they see and hear is a mean, nasty God. They do what I want, or it's a lightning bolt for you. But it's not that way. It's not. So there's going to be a lot of messages coming along. You're going to hear a lot of things about Easter egg hunts and all the Easter stuff and the girls in their dresses and everything like that. And it's, when I was young, I had three, three da two daughters, and they were always in the nice little dresses for Easter. Of course, then we called it Passover, but still same thing. Think about what Jesus really did for us when he went on that cross and died. He made it so that he truly understands us. He knows everything you feel. You can go to him about anything. You can go to the Father about anything. You can cry up into God's lap and cry your eyes out when something doesn't go well. Or dance with him for joy when things do. He's real. He exists. And all we have to do is look up from our video game and see him. And he will come into your life and he will fill you with such joy that you'll just you don't know what to do with yourself. He runs out all the evil, all the wicked, all the nasty. He's in there jerking out bad stuff constantly. That's why every time something goes wrong, good happens from that. All you got to do is look. It's there. It may not be for you because maybe what you need is to see that someone else got something good from that. And he keeps working on our heart. 
He keeps working on our mind, and he keeps working on our soul. Because one day, he's going to do away with all this. In the end, God says, what I have in store for you is so incredible, I'm not even going to bother to try to explain it, because you cannot understand. That is an absolute amazing statement. You know, in our day and age, we look into the future of Star Trek, flying all over the place, doing all kinds of things. But we can imagine that, so that's not what it is. And Jesus' death is what made it all possible for us. Do we think about that, or do we think he just died so we can live forever? No, he died so we can have life, and we can have it more abundantly. That we can live on a world that's full of evil and nasty and death and misery, and yet have a happy, contented life. And when you get to that point, you become a point man for Jesus. Because he brings people to you. And they see it. And they ask, why? And that starts them on their journey. One to the next. It's not hard being part of Jesus' work. He tells us, my yoke is light. Be happy. Enjoy. Show love to everybody. Jesus' death is probably the most loving act that's ever been done in human history. Maybe even God history. I don't know. There's a lot we don't know. So I'd like to end this with a quick prayer. Holy Father, you are the God of the universe. You created all things. Your love is perfect. You know everything that is going to happen and everything that has happened. Father, you love us so much that you gave your only son who came to earth. He lived a perfect life, died a perfect death, and was resurrected and sits with you now. Father, Jesus understands everything that we think, what we say, how we feel. He can, and he knows that we want to love you. But there's so many things that Satan has put in our paths that need to be removed. And we ask that you remove these things. And as we go through this Easter season, that we contemplate the enormity of what Jesus did for us by dying on this planet for us. Not just taking away our sin, but opening up our hearts and our minds to you, where we can live in complete confidence, happiness, joy, contentment, not worrying about the horrible things that might happen, but living in the moment with you forever. So, Father, thank you for the sacrifice Jesus gave. Thank you for letting him do it. And thank you for letting us know about it. And we ask all these things in his name, because he is our Savior. He is our Lord. But most importantly, he's our big Bubba. And he's the one that takes care of us. And we thank you for him. Amen.